I think our next speaker is Professor Roberto Ferrara. Uh, he's going to talk about uh, ultra hyper, the durability-based design of ultra hyper durability concrete structures to extend the structural lifespan in extremely aggressive environment. Okay, so Professor, uh, the stage is on yours. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. Can you can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, we don't see your screen yet. Yeah, so... I'm, just, I'm just sharing it now. You can see it or not? Uh, we can see, yeah, we can see your screen. Okay, perfect. Can, yes. Okay. Thanks a lot and thanks to Professor Getu and to all the friends and colleagues at IIT Madras for having invited me to this uh, workshop. Uh, really, we can say that the sun never sets on our workshop because we started very early in the morning for me and we will go until lunch time but in other zones the time is different and as you could see from the picture that was shown before i took professor mobasher invitation very seriously because that picture was taken at the grand canyon so i visited arizona beautiful landscape so actually what i'm going to talk about today is the vision that we are currently pursuing in the framework of quite a large consortium funded by the european commission under the name of resilience project and you can see there that the, the way we decided to write it is a little bit different from how we shall write the uh, word and we will understand later why. Well, as a matter of fact, we have also uh, um, heard from uh, the presentations previously that as civil engineers, we have big challenges nowadays for the society, for the economy and for the planet. Uh, never uh, more than now in which most of us uh, have been forced to stay locked inside, we have realized that how much important are transportation infrastructures. And as a matter of fact, we, if we invest 1% of our gross domestic product in infrastructures, we generate 1.5% increase uh, in just uh, four years. Coastal infrastructures, coastal protection, Professor Pillai, Pillai was mentioning it before. And from our perspective, European point of view, Europe has 66,000 kilometers coastline, which is three times as much the coastline of US. And big problems may come from climate change and from the sea rise level. And also with the transition towards a carbon neutral society, we have to promote the growth of clean energy production going, for example, for harvesting offshore wind, ocean and geothermal energy. And very uh, interesting and challenging perspectives also come from the so-called blue growth. So the economy related to the sea, because 3 billion people on our planet uh, actually take their livelihood from the oceans, from the sea, most of them in developing countries. We know that more than two thirds of the planet is made up of water, but currently we only make up 5% of our economy from the sea. So these are the challenges. And if we go into our civil engineering sector and into our concrete engineering sector, we want to build faster, we want to go higher or deeper if we go to the sea, we want to go farther to be more cost effective, to build for a longer time in a world we want to build in such a way that our structures and infrastructures are more resilient. So, which is the scenario? This is the Museum of Tomorrow in uh, Rio de Janeiro. And when I visited it a couple of years ago, I was hit by a sentence which was in the accident. We have become a geological force. So we are able to shape the planet. In previous presentation, we, we heard that more than half of the world population lives in the cities, up to 80% in high income countries. And every year, about 75 million people relocate from countryside to urban areas. And in few years from now, because 2045 is really the day after tomorrow, more than two thirds of the world population will live in urban areas. So which is the scenario? Well, we have to face climate change. For example, this means that we will have uh, uh, increased CO2 content in the atmosphere, global warming, which will increase the carbonation risk of structures. Increased of chloride induced corrosion because of increased water salinity or sea temperature, and increased physical wearing of structures. 
In this graph, in a study made at the University of British Columbia some years ago, they compared the expected service life in a city like Mumbai, but there were other uh, big cities like it in the study, uh, built in 2000 and built in 2030. So the expected service life, just because of the climate change condition, is going to be reduced as a matter of fact. And uh, uh, if you have structures exposed to a marine environment, these are examples of structures built as new according to the most recent codes. One of them is in Morocco, the other them is in Spain because of deficiency in materials, deficiency in construction, deficiency in any other step of the construction process, but also of accidental events, you can see how these structures can end up in just a matter of few years. Or this is a case of a sulfate attack or of acid attack where you have the corrosion of the matrix. This is a geothermal tower in a, a geothermal power plant in Italy where the sulfate-rich water corrodes the matrix, and you can see that the process goes on also after the retrofitting. So as a matter of fact, we also have to think of the durability of our retrofitting because recent studies have shown that 50% of repaired concrete structures fail once again, and one over four among them in just five years after the repair. So as a matter of fact, we have to look into a different performance than the strength, because as far as strength is concerned, we are now very, very skilled because we can get strength very high, but most of all, we can get this with a very effective employment of the binder. You can see on the right graph, the uh, employment of binder in kilos per cubic meter in the concrete to obtain a unit megapascal of strength. And I think that we have reached some kind of asymptote. It's difficult to go uh, farther down to, to reduce the state. So this is the scenario in which 14 European partners, uh, we are listed here under the coordination of myself at Politecnico di Milano, we gather it together and we applied for a funding uh, uh, with the European uh, Commission. And we, uh, the interesting thing is that in the consortium, we are six universities, but we have eight industrial partners, which cover up the whole value chain of the concrete construction industry from production of materials up to precast companies and large scale engineering firms and engineering contractors. And we uh, uh, set up this project that we call it resilience. Uh, we focus on green energy service infrastructures. We focus on offshore structures. We want to enhance the durability. And we ended up with this ultra high durability concrete and durability assessment based design for improving the long-term performance of structures under aggressive exposures. So we started, I hope that the video will be shown. We started with something which is very well known in our labs, but also uh, in uh, applications worldwide. These are some students in the lab doing ultra high performance concrete with self-leveling consistency. So they were very proud. They put this uh, nice uh, Bruce Springsteen soundtrack uh, uh, on, uh, as a soundtrack of the movie. And we wanted to upgrade the ultra high performance concrete concept to ultra high durability concrete and to apply it into six pilots, which have been built, I will show you uh, at the end, in uh, different countries in Europe. So we started from ultra high performance concrete. We went up for mechanical characterization. We did uh, bending tests and direct tension tests. We went through a back identification process like the one Professor Mubasher was talking before. So we check at the reliability of our identification procedure. You can see we had lower and upper bound depending on the geometry of the, the beam that we use at deep or shallow because we have some effect of the fiber orientation depending on the thickness. And we designed it, we started designing a water tank, very simple. This is the reference reinforced concrete solution. It's 10 centimeters thick in our mock-up, but actually in the reality is 40. And you can see with a simple elastic analysis, the level of stresses that you expect. You have on the top, the stresses in the inner side and on the bottom figure, the stresses on the outer side. They are quite low. In some cases, you can cope with them just with tensile strength of concrete, but we neglect them in design. But with regular reinforcement, you can surely cope with this level of stresses. Then we ended up with the solution made up with no conventional reinforcement, but only with ultra high performance concrete. The constitutive relationship is showing the bottom left of the slide. You can see the expected service level. We have some very high stresses at the bottom, 8.6 Newton per square millimeter. But if you look at the 
constitutive relationship of the concrete, you can see that you can cope with that because you are in the strain hardening regime of this material. And actually, you have to cope with a higher initial cost. This is a strain hardening, fiber reinforced cementitious material, high binder content, high fiber content. We will see that we will add some uh, nano constituents. It's a very high initial cost. But considering that you will have enhanced durability in the cracked state and under extremely aggressive exposure condition, you can really expect a saving in the life cycle cost. So what did we do in order to go faster? So we first of all investigated and assessed the possibility of stimulating to crystalline and mixture the self-healing performance. And you can see that not only the crack seal completely, but also as long as the stability of the mechanical performance along repeated cracking and dealing cycles, you have that this performance is maintained over, over time. And also we are now currently investigated what happens at the microscopic level, because you can see in the picture that these healing products deposit also at the fiber matrix interface. So you can also improve locally the fiber matrix bond and enhance the performance. Then we added alumina nanofibers inside the uh, composition of the material, or we also use a nanocellulose product. We wanted to check there, for example, internal curing effect and nanoscale reinforcement. We have to solve the problem of finding the right dispersion, because even if we had a very small quantities, these products come in a suspension. And if the suspension is too dilute, you risk that half of your mixing water comes with the suspension of the nanoparticles. So we had to end up with very dense suspension of this nano constituent up to 10% concentration, which is five to 10 times as much the normal concentration these suspensions are provided. But when we look at the compression strength effect of the nanoparticles, we were not very pleased because simply we said, okay, there is a marginal improvement. So is really the game worth the candle as we used it to say with the joke in Italy. But when we look at into the flexural strength performance, we were a little bit more happy because there you can see really some benefits due to the use of nanofibers and nanoparticles, especially in the long term. Or you can see a very uh, significant reduction in the porosity or a reduction in the autogenous shrinkage, which can be a serious issue in this kind of composites. And you can see here some very nice microscope pictures. These are the alumina nanofibers compared with the mix without. You can see this thin fibers reinforcing really the crystalline structures and the same happens for the nanocellulose, which also act as a seed for the hydration processes of cement. And also as far as the cell feeling is concerned, this is a thesis which was just discussed in Milano last month. You can see the reference concrete are the gray dots or changing the type of cement are the yellow dots whereas the blue, the red, and the green are the mixed with alumina nanofibers, and you go higher with both the crack sealing efficiency and the recovery of uh, impermeability versus water capillary such. So in the end, we said, which is the boundary that we can reach employing this material? We change it a little bit to the structure concept. Do not design anymore the walls of the basin as continuous labs, but design them as precast square slabs and use some column buttresses in order to stiffen them at regular spaces. So these are the results of an analysis that we performed. And you can see that some tensile stresses are 11 megapascal, which is really higher even than the tensile strength of this kind of materials. But then you have to go into nonlinear analysis. We performed a yield line analysis and we get that the structure is safe, considering the nonlinear resources and redundancy and redistribution resources that it has. We also performed, and this was recently published in the proceedings of a workshop held in Israel in January, the life cycle analysis evaluation compared, uh, uh, comparing the, the, the performance with respect to the seven indicators, you can see that you have improvements going from 11% in terms of eutrophication up to 60 and 70% in terms of reduction of fossil fuel and resource consumption. So this kind of solution as far as the geothermal tank is concerned is very, very interesting from this point of view. What are we working on? Now we are, we are working on uh, implementing these results into a durability life cycle based assessed life cycle prediction. So we want to see how the structural performance changes over time, changing the type of material, change the type of structural solution. 
also trying to identify relevant steps in the service life to understand about the need of maintenance, but also to quantify the end of the service life where it would be better, for example, to completely decommission the structure and to build a new one. But this is truly the end of the life of a structure, or we can also think of regenerating it. These are the results of a thesis which is going to be discussed next Saturday in Milano, was performed jointly with the University of Malta and Valencia. And actually these students came up to be very resilient because they come back to Italy with the last flight which was available from Malta to Italy before the lockdown. So it was quite, quite an adventure. But you can see, compare the yellow curve, which is a reference mix with the other ones where we replace it 50% or even 100% of the natural sand with the same material crushed and recycled. These materials have a lot of unhydrated binder. So if you use it as a sand, you can foster the further development of strength, even in the long term. And you can compensate what generally happens when you use recycled aggregates in concrete, which is the reduction of the strength compared as you use uh, natural aggregates. So actually, I want to show you the image of the pilots. This is the casting on uh, uh, a construction site. We did this uh, at the end of February, just before the lockdown in Italy. And this is the pilot whose design, whose numerical analysis I show it. You have the three tanks. If you start from the far side, you have the regular reinforced concrete, the continuous uh, wall UHPC concrete, and the precast. And you can see in the inset on the top left, the reduction of thickness from 10 centimeter to six centimeter down to three centimeters. These precast square slabs are three centimeters thick. We also cast a retrofitting of an existing tank for mud basin. And you can see this is the detail of the, I, I hope that the movie is seen, this is the detail of the concrete flowing in the corner. So we also coped with details. This is an interesting structure. It's a precast, pre-stressed raft, a girder for muscle rafting. Uh, this is the consortium we visited it in the end of February, sorry, and it was floated. So now it's floating in the sea and it starts transmitting data from the monitoring system. It was floated at the beginning of May. I put here the YouTube link. The, the movie is very long, so I cannot show, but it's quite interesting to show how it was floated and now it's in the Valencia Arbor. We also have this other pilot. It's shown here in the lab of the University of Valencia. It's a floater for an offshore wind tower, which is going to be installed in the Sagunto port close to Valencia. In a few weeks from now, we open as long as Spain will reopen some activities. This is a, a floating pontoon. Uh, it's going to be installed in Ireland. And, and we use a textile reinforced concrete here to change from the structural solution. You can see here pontoon three to much lighter and much more effective in the case of pontoon two and one. And we use it also textile reinforced concrete for the retrofitting of an existing structure. This is a water tank in the harbor of Malta. And this actually the only uh, site which was not uh, blocked by the lockdown. So also this is completed. The other pilots were completed before the lockdown. And we have going to retrofit this and to put it back in use. It's an interesting structure which was built before the Second World War and it's part of a, a, a recover and rejuvenation projects of this kind of infrastructure uh, led by the Malta government. So I want to, uh, you know, this is the time for the commercials. We have summarized uh, all these activities into a MOOC, which was, was launched on May 11. And I also have to acknowledge the collaboration of Ryland because it helped us to uh, disseminate the information and to have a live event on May 11 to welcome all the MOOC uh, participants. You can find all the information on our website on the link to the MOOC. The MOOC is free. You can enjoy it at uh, your own convenience because the lectures are always there available and they will be available uh, surely until the end of uh, year 2021. And I want to thank you for your attention, surely, or the partners of the consortium. You can see us during the meetings. This is the last meeting that we had in Valencia. We had good uh, Spanish dinner. And I also want to thank my uh, research and students team at Politecnico di Milano. Uh, you can see all of us in this picture, including a guy some of you may recognize who was master student at IT Madras and now is doing his PhD in Milano. Thank you very much for your attention.
Okay. Uh, okay. So uh, appreciate the very interesting talk. Uh, so I see some questions from audience. Uh, there are many, actually, there are many questions about uh, alumina fiber. So first question is, how about uh, can you elaborate on the means of dispersion of the aluminum nanofibers? Well, the, the dispersion is similar to any other kind of nanoparticle. So we have a, a, a presonication a dispersion process and actually you make this suspension, which is quite stable. So basically mm -hmm. you ship the suspension like an admixture and you use it like an admixture in the concrete. Um, then uh, we, we did a, a normal steering, high energy steering, just before adding it into the, uh, into the mixing. But you have to go through a, um, uh, sonication process and actually mm -hmm. there are means to make this uh, this process stable obviously depending on the different types of nanomaterial that you use uh, mm -hmm. uh, the developer of this material can have different stabilization process of the dispersion okay <clears throat> so i think uh, we have to use uh, kind of suspension with yeah. um, nanofiber so yes how did you optimize the dispersion steps for making that suspension with nanofibers? Well, actually, yeah. actually, these are processes, as I said, we have different nano, mm. <clears throat> nano products in our, uh, in our cases, and we had to optimize each process for each uh, suspension. Actually, some of these processes are also pat patented by the companies. Uh, and uh, in our case, the main issue was that we had to make stable a 10% concentration suspension. For other industrial purposes, you have 2% concentration suspension. So mm -hmm. uh, any, any kind of application may require a different pro process. Mm -hmm. In this case, because for, uh, yeah. no, 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 please, please go ahead. Yeah. Oh, so, I mean, the, that is also one of my interesting, uh, one of my interests. So dispersion of the large quantity is uh, something that we have to solve for construction application. But the dispersion, degree of dispersion changes uh, as a function of time. So how have you solved that kind of a problem of, of time dependent dispersion and the scale up problem in the dispersion? You mean the shelf life of the product in a sense? So if this, uh, or, or, or what do you mean exactly? Yeah, so for example, if we try to disperse the CNT in the, in the water, we have to mm -hmm. do the sonication, we have to use specific surfactant, but even with that process, the degree of dispersion will be uh, decreased as a function of time. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, actually, this is what, well, in this case, we simply, uh, you know, remixed uh, the suspension with a high energy steering just before mm -hmm. mixing it, just before mixing it to be sure. Then we check at the effectiveness of the dispersion, but you can only do ex post and you need some destructive tests. So uh, mm -hmm. uh, we, we check at it, we went really to, to, to make some, uh, microstructural analysis to see if we had the presence of the uh, nanoparticles. But this is uh, one of the um, issues, which is the issue when you bring this to a real scale construction site. Mm -hmm. Out yeah. Of <clears throat> yeah, so personally, it's very nice to see uh, many uh, actual projects that you your team is doing. And then the next question is about uh, <clears throat> in which way alumina nanofibers differ from other types of fibers? Well, actually, uh, well, uh, they, they are different because the material is different, yes. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. Well, we detected that uh, there is an interesting uh, synergy action because first of all, they are fibers, so they nano reinforce. And, and this is quite interesting. Um, the other thing is that, um, as far as we understood by studying them, they have a hydroxyl group on their surface. So this makes them an interesting material to be used inside the concrete because they can interact. So it's not simply a nano reinforcement effect, but there is an interaction. Mm -hmm. And we are currently studying it also with respect to the um, behavior in extremely aggressive environment because we detected some differences, whether we cured the specimen in a, a moist room or whether we put the specimen since the beginning in sulfate-rich water. And mm -hmm. that is where they really performed excellently. Mm -hmm. Okay, so <clears throat> I think our time, time is up. 
So thank you very much again for Professor Ferrara for sharing your very interesting project. Thank with, you, really uh, a pleasure for me. No, it, with the, the actual scale application, I think that is very, very important for us to differentiate our material science research with uh, the material science engineering. We have to deal with the both sides. So I think uh, our session is finished. So thank you all the speakers for uh, giving a very nice uh, presentation and giving some insight on each research topic and answering the questions. So I think uh, I think it's a time for lunch in India, I guess. Okay. So yeah, I will go for a uh, mid-morning coffee. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, th thank you very much, uh, Dr. Moon, for chairing this session and giving us the uh, introduction very nicely to what is going to be talked about. I would like to thank uh, all the speakers uh, Barzin Mubashar, who stayed awake, I think it was close to midnight or past midnight when he joined us from Arizona. And uh, for Liberato, he's been uh, following the workshop from very early morning and my colleague Radha Krishna Pillai. So thank you very much. Uh, it is a pleasure to have all of you and uh, to hear such interesting work that is going on all around the world.